בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, שבוע טוב, שבוע מבורך. We're starting off the week, ברוך השם, on our uh, Sunday program here in Sharet Zion in uh, Sunny Isles, Florida. For all of the Floridians that keep uh, getting surprised when they find out that I do a shurim in Florida, we actually do it three times a week, ברוך השם. Uh, so we're here in Sharet Zion on uh, Sundays and uh, Wednesdays. And then Tuesdays we're in Aventura. Locations sometimes change, but generally they do not. Bezrat Hashem, today's shiur will be for a refuah uh, shlema for Avi Mori, David Ben Esriya, uh, for uh, my dear mother Doris Bajora, my Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Sara Bat Levana, Ovadia Ben Levana, and Yosef uh, Ben Levana. Also, uh, Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara bat Anat, uh, Dvora bat Mercedes, Elisheva Chaya bat Sara, Esther bat Zipora, uh, Eliyahu ben Freda, is it Elu Nishmat or is it Elu? And also Elu Nishmat, Eliyahu ben Freda. Um, so uh, today's show is on a uh, very interesting topic. Besiyat Dishmaya, we will uh, say it as we learned it from Rabbi Ephraim. Uh, God bless him and uh, all of his Torah, Bezat Hashem, and his family. Uh, and hopefully uh, shed some light on some interesting things. I know that uh, people like to talk about Mashiach. And uh, Joshua, maybe Joshua is a Mashiach. Maybe Joshua is a Mashiach. Tzaddik. I love Joshua. Joshua is the best. Uh, surprise me, Joshua. I didn't see you here two minutes ago. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, see, you made me happy. Yeah, with these people, nothing happened. So, don't tell nobody. That. So anyway, so, um, people love to talk about Mashiach. I remember, Baruch Hashem, when, uh, we first started, uh, recognizing HaKadosh Baruch Hu, one of my favorite, personal favorite topics was to talk about Mashiach, the end of days, the uh, destruction. And um, easily assuming I'm going to be part of the saved. You know, all of us are like assuming, no, no, I'm for sure being saved. Why? I'm keeping Shabbat now. I didn't even know what Borer was. But I don't know, I'm keeping Shabbat. I'm just not driving. I didn't know when that's nothing, by the way. But I thought I was for sure going to be saved. And unfortunately, many of us think we're going to be saved. Bezat Hashem, we will be. Bezat Hashem, many more will be. But, Rabotai Karim, I can promise you, it's not going to be easy. And the reason why is because in order to be saved by Mashiach, we have to know a few things about Torah, a few things about Mashiach himself and what's going to happen, uh, what it's going to take uh, to be saved at the time of Mashiach. And one of the interesting things that uh, I haven't heard from anybody um, is uh, the details of Eliyahu Navi. Because in several places in the Torah, the prophets tell us that uh, the last prophet, Malachi, it's uh, also by some of the other prophets, where it uh, talks about that three days before Mashiach comes, Eliyahu Navi is going to come. Eliyahu Navi is going to come, and he's going to tell us, Mashiach's coming. And until now, that's generally what we've taught. The three days before Mashiach comes, Eliyahu Navi is going to come. Now, the good news is, is that that's still valid, that's still true, that's still the Pshat. But if you look at some of the Chachamim, including in them the Rambam, you will see that there is a little bit more commentary on that particular verse that talks about Eliyahu Navi coming before Mashiach. Now, we're going to start off with a Gemara that is almost like a uh, prophecy, if you will, even though there was a, uh, um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was not a uh, uh, prophet. He, of course, surely had Wach Kodesh and had uh, extraordinary Kedusha that was um, second to none. 
But at the same token, a, uh, we learned from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Gemara, in the Zohar, and many other Sfarim, that some of the things that he said might as well be a prophecy. Might as well be a prophecy, because it's clear as day. But one of the things that uh, I never knew really was a prophecy relevant to this Yule until Sunny turned on the camera. Fresh chidush for you. So, Gemara Maseret Sanhedrin, page 97b, says the following. In the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says to his son, Ra'iti bnei aliyah ve'en mu'atin. Im elefen, ani uvni me'em. Im me'em, ani uvni me'em. Im shnaim em, ani uvni em. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, I have seen the people of the highest level, biggest tzaddikim in the world, and they are few. If they are a thousand, I and my son are among them. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is already telling you, if there's a thousand tzaddikim in the entire world, me and my son for sure are one of them. Okay, Baruch Hashem. If they are a hundred I and my son are among them. He says, if there's two tzaddikim b'nei aliyah, there's b'nei aliyah, there's, there's a hundred of them in the entire world, me and my son are among them as well. Meaning we're 2% of the people in the world. And if they are only two, there's only two b'nei aliyah in the world, then myself and my son are them. Oh, you ask yourself a question. Akadosh Baruch Hu, what does he hate? He hates a few things. One of the things he hates, he hates arrogance. So can you in your wildest imagination say that the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Baal Zohar, the, the Tana Kadosh that's in the Torah, that's in the Gemara, all over the place, telling us all types of Chidushim, Chas Shalom, we can even think in our wildest dreams that he has arrogance? That he says if there's only two Bnei Aliyah in the entire world, we're with them? You can't say that. So what does it mean? Bezat Hashem will answer that at the end of the shoe. Now, the topic of mysticism and generally discussing the Zohar, Kabbalah, and all types of uh, mystical teachings if you've noticed and you've been around the religious world for some time, or even if you've just joined in the last couple of years, you notice that if you type the word Zohar or Kabbalah, you're going to get a lot more hits than if you type the word Chumash or Parasha or uh, Musar. A lot more. Why? Because Kabbalah and Zohar and mysticism even the goyim, the heretics, the biggest reshaim in the world, they also want to teach it. They don't even know Alachot Shabbat. They don't even know what the Ten Commandments are by heart. But they say, no, no, the most mystical things in the Torah, we're teaching it too. You have a place called Kabbalah Center. It should be called the Kfira Center. They teach Kabbalah La'am. What's Kabbalah La'am? Kabbalah to the nations. Meaning anyone can, uh, can learn Kabbalah. The funny thing is, Kabbalah is something that's secret. That's what it means. Secret from hand to hand. Teacher to a student. One to one. That's what Kabbalah is coming for. You got it. You got a Kabbalah from one teacher directly to the student. Not one teacher to a class of a thousand people. There's even a class specifically discusses the certain things you only teach to a few people. The only things you don't teach at all. Kabbalah is one of those things. It's one to one. That's what it means, Kabbalah. So to say Kabbalah la'am, Kabbalah to the nations, is an oxymoron. How are you going to teach Kabbalah to the public? How? It's not supposed to be taught. Now, in Tikkunei Zohar, page 114 Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai tells us, when the hidden, these hidden teachings will be uncovered, Many men will gather to learn them and deal with them. 
So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai himself is saying, this teachings, this entire Zohar, this Kabbalah, this mystical stuff, the Midrashim, all these different things, it's going to be hidden for many, many years. It was written over 2,000 years ago, but only discovered in the last few hundred years. It's not something that we've had for the last couple thousand years. The Rambam wrote that if he knew about the Zohar at the time that he was writing Mishneh Torah, certain things would be different. Meaning it was only discovered in the last thousand years, less than thousand years. It was hidden from the world for over 1,500 years. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is telling you, it's going to be hidden. But once it's uncovered, many people are going to want to deal with it. Now, there are four parts to the Torah. As far as four classifications which is the word, spells out the word pardes. Pardes is where the Americans got, got the word paradise, by the way. But pardes stands for four words, pshat, remez, drash, and sod. The pshat is the surface meaning. You read the verse, Vayomer Hashem and Moshe. Hashem spoke to Moshe. Okay, that's what we understand. Hashem spoke to Moshe. Literal meaning. We understand this thing. Pshat. Remez is like the hints, the deeper meaning, the allegory, what you understand from it through looking at different places and so on. If you saw somebody come into a room and uh, there's a, he's making uh, footprints with mud, you would understand that it's raining outside. You don't understand it's raining outside. Why? Because he probably stepped in some puddle or the sand outside is, is, is wet. Therefore, it's either raining right now or it was raining recently. And therefore, that's the reason why he has mud on his feet. So the allegory, the deeper meanings, the hints, all of the different things that you're going to get from the Torah, that's the remez. Drash means the Midrashim. But also different rules within the Torah. There are certain rules. The Gemara tells us that we're put together. If there is a vav in the beginning of the word, that means something. If there isn't a vav, that means something else. If there's the word et, uh, you know, in a certain place when it's really not necessary, which means and, you know, kabed et avicha ve'et imecha, honor your your father and your mother. Why does it say honor your parents? Kabed et orecha or kabed et avicha ve'imecha. Why say et twice? Hamim say the extra et means that also honor your brother, your older brother. Anytime there's the word et extra there, that's a additional meaning. So when it says ve'irayet Hashem, when you you fear God, but it also has the word et. So one of the chachamim was confused. What does it mean et? Who else should you fear other than Hashem? Rabbi Akiva came and said, Ah. Oh, you have to fear your rabbi too. Fear your rabbi like you fear God. That's what the word et stands for in that particular aspect. So that's the Midrashim, but also the commentaries, how it talks about Akedat Yitzchak, and it says, okay, uh, uh, Avraham Avinu nearly uh, cut off his, uh, his throat, but then if you go into some of the Midrashim, it actually says that it, he did cut his throat, and Hashem took Yitzchak, Yitzchak Avinu to, to Gan Eden, healed him himself, replaced his neshama, with a fe- with, he had a feminine neshama, put a masculine neshama, all types of really, really interesting teachings. Point being, is that there is other things beyond the pshat, beyond the basic meanings of the Torah, beyond the things that you can even understand yourself. For example, all of the superhero movies that have made billions and billions of dollars in the world today, the X-Men, all these people, all of them, with no exception, every single one of them that's famous, not the successful ones, not the Friarim, successful ones, Incredible Hulk, all these people, you see them in Midrashim in the Torah. You see them in Midrashim in the Torah. Some people are amazed by the, uh, the character, the phoenix, the bird that uh, never dies. That's in the Torah. It's a real bird. There's one bird like that. One bird like that, that's in a uh, Parashat Noach. That's the only thing that didn't sin. That and the fish. And Hashem blessed this bird this phoenix bird, because you didn't sin, you're never going to die. Every thousand years, it dies, and then the ashes grow back, and it relives. It's a special bird. So this, this, this phoenix is not an invention of X-Men. It's 
It's not an invention of the Goyim. It's an invention of the Torah. It's a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Same thing, Incredible Hulk. Incredible Hulk. You look at Midrash Me'am Lo'ez, Midrash Rabbah, the, the wars of the tribes. You look at Yehuda. Yehuda was very powerful, would roar, would beat up people, break buildings just with his roar, and so on and so forth. You see that the, 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 uh, the, uh, the tribes were powerful people. Powerful beyond our imagination. Point being, Rabotai, is that we see that the Midrashim have many, many interesting things. Sometimes Midrashim conflict with each other. For example, last week we had a, uh, one of our new Torah tunes, the cartoons we've been publishing for each Parashat Shavua. And it talked about the very famous Midrash of how Avram Avinu saw that his, you know, his father was uh, selling idols in a, uh, in a store and he put Avram as a little boy to run the store while he's uh, doing other things. And Avram detested these idols and decided to break all of them. A woman came and wanted to give food to one of the idols. Avram said, why are you feeding one of these idols? She said, I want him to protect me. He says, you're an old lady. You're an old lady. You, you, you th- this idol, my father made him yesterday. He's going to protect you. And then he decided to take this food and destroy all of the, uh, all of the uh, idols. Actually, it was an old man. Long story short, he was a little boy. But then the same Midrash Rabbah, same Midrash Rabbah says there's also an opinion that really Avram was 47 years old. Not uh, 3, 4, 5, 6 years old. 47. Now, if there's a conflict between Chachamim and the Midrash, you can pick a side, no problem. Why? Because it doesn't affect the halacha. It doesn't affect whether you're going to drive on Shabbat or not drive on Shabbat. It's not going to affect whether you eat kosher or don't eat kosher. We all learn halacha from them. So sometimes there's a conflict between the Midrashim. Sometimes the Midrashim look like they're conflicting, but they really don't. You just don't understand them. The point being is that Midrash is one of the foundations of the Torah. And then there's the last part, which is Sod. Sod is the secret part of the Torah, the mystical stuff. The stuff that you have to be a very serious Talmud Chacham to not only learn it, but also to know how to use it. There are certain secretive things that the average person can do, but there are certain secret things that the average person should not do. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga says that there are two major subjects when it comes to mysticism that one has to be very careful with. Maase Merkava and Maase Bereshit. Maase Merkava is like theology and the heavenly secrets. What's going on in Shemaim? Don't delve into that too much at all. It's dangerous, even if you're Talmud Chacham. Maase Bereshit the secrets of creation and nature, the secrets of nature, what the Rambam calls the metaphysical. Now, the Gemara in Masechah Chagigah says, don't teach the issues of morality to just three people. The details of what happens between a man and a woman shouldn't teach it to three people. Why? Because one of them is going to lose attention and then you're going to focus on one student, and then the two of them are going to start thinking garbage in their head. So the real details of what happens when you're a man and a woman, don't teach the three people. Also, don't teach Maaseh Bereshit to two people. One on one. But Maaseh Merkava, don't even teach it to one. Meaning, if he doesn't know it on his own, don't teach it. He has to be at a very, very special level to know Maaseh Merkava. Now, the Gemara continues in the Masechi Chagigah, page 15, says that four of the sages went into the Pardes. Four of them went into the Pardes, went into the mystical parts of the Torah. Some say they physically went to heaven. They did something called Ilui Neshama. Ilui Neshama is when someone simply takes the Neshama and shh, goes up to Shemaim without dying. And they saw what happened in Shemaim. The names were Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Elisha Ben Avuya, who is forever known as Acher, the other, and Rabbi Akiva. They all went up to heaven and saw what was going on over there. There is a tzaddik 
in Eretz Yisrael, Rav Shani. He says that he is able to do it not only for himself but for other people. It's very hard for many people to believe it, even though there's proof, because this is something that no one has been able to really truly do, at least not publicly, since the days of the Arizal. But nonetheless, he is the great, uh, he's the grandson or great grandson of the Avat Chaim. So he's a very big Mekubal. But the point being is that you see that some of his shurim, if you speak Hebrew, he speaks about this. And it's unbelievable that someone in our generation even has knowledge of this stuff. Point being is, don't mess with it. Why? Look what happened in the story of people much bigger than Rav Shani. Much bigger than anybody in the world today. Much bigger than the whole world together. These four Tanaim. Ben Azai peeked into the Pardes. He looked into the Pardes. It was so beautiful. It was so delicious over there. His neshama didn't want to go back to his body. He died. It was so amazing over there. He says, I cannot, I can't go back to what? this world. Who wants this? He stayed over there. He died. But that's not what Hashem's will is. Hashem doesn't want him to die. He wants him to learn Torah. But he died. Ben Zoma peeked into the Pardes and went crazy. This, unfortunately, Rabotai Karim is still happening to this day. People that delve into the Zohar Kadosh, into Kabbalah, into the mystical aspects of the Torah, and the Loha Ui, they're not in that level, especially when they go into the super mystical things, such as the names of angels, and start uh, saying names of angels, and they don't know what they're doing. These angels, they're not, uh, you know, regular people. If you're not in that level to say their name, they come down and they hurt you. There's one Sadiq that I recently found out about, was a very, very serious Talmud Chacham, started delving into the Zohar, went crazy recently, just a few months ago. There's a whole hospital in Yerushalayim, in, in Harnof, just for those people. People that lose their mind from learning, but learning things that are beyond their pay grade. That's why it's foolish when people say, oh yeah, I'm learning Zohar. Do you know the Shukhan Aruch? Do you know al Shabbat? Do you know Parashat Shavua? you know any of this? Do you know how to spell Parashat Shavua? Do you know Hebrew? They don't know anything. But no, I'm going to the Zohar. They play with an atomic bomb thinking it's a, uh, you know, it's a uh, firecracker. So, Ben Zoma peeked into it, lost his mind. Hashem Yachem. Elisha Acher is a very interesting story. Elisha Acher was the rabbi, one of the rabbis of Rabbi Akiva. He went up there and he started seeing things. He saw angels, but he saw the most powerful of all angels, the Memtit. He's so powerful, can't even say his name. The Gemara says, what is his job? He sits there all day and he writes all of the merits of Am Yisrael. Now when Elisha ben Avuya saw this, it lost, he lost his mind. Why? He says, it doesn't make any sense. It says in the Torah that all the angels stand on one leg. What is this angel doing sitting? Turn him into a kofel. Why? Because he saw something that didn't make sense to him. And he became a very big heretic. Hashem Yachem. It took several generations to take him out of Gehenom. But the only reason he was able to come out of Gehenom, even though he had all of these avirot, is number one, he had an enormous amount of Torah. But two, he had an enormous Talmud named Rabbi Mir Balanes. If you have a Talmud named Rabbi Mir Balanes, you can do whatever you want. But until then, you listen to basic cable. Basic over here. You listen to what we say over here, basic. So Elisha ben Avoya went, peeked into the Pardes, Hashem Yachem, he lost his mind. He started becoming kofel. <coughs> Committed murder, all types of things. Then it was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva peeked into the Pardes and he went in, in peace and he came out in peace. He's the only one that survived. So we see here, Rabotai, that dealing with the mystical, with the supernatural, with the things that are above and beyond the, 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 the norm are, is not exactly something that's for everyone. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't peek into certain things. The, the Arav Chida, Allah Shalom, says, someone who only learns the Pshat Remez and Drash, meaning the first three levels, the surface, the hints, and the Midrashim, is going to be an incomplete Talmud. Just as the Pasuk says, Al There's a Pasuk in Tehidim 32 verse 9. 
It says, Al tiyu kesus pepered. Don't be like a horse and like a donkey. But kepered means like a donkey, meaning pe resh dalit. The pshat remedas. Don't just learn the three. Also, go into the mystical at some point when you're at that level. When you're at that level. But what happens if a person goes straight into the uh, into the uh, sod, into the secret? That's uh Tevot Sachan. What's Sachan? Tipesh, fool. Someone goes straight into the secret is a fool. Why? You're going and you're going to try to perform uh, your, your science project on an atomic bomb. You're going to try to uh, to really see if the foundation of the building is uh, is good while you're under the building. You don't know what you're doing, but you're going to mess with it. You don't know what you're doing. Point being, Rabotai, is there's a time and a place for everything. So when you see some of these people, whether it's the Kabbalah Center or some other kofel named uh, some Russian guy who outright said to Larry King live, yes, do you believe in God? He said no. But he teaches Kabbalah to millions of people. The guy says, you believe, could you, do other rabbis agree with you? He says no. He was on Larry King live, this kofel. Uh, other rabbis don't agree with me. I don't, he doesn't believe in God. Nothing. But he teaches Kabbalah to millions of people. Very famous. Because he says this is the secret to life and nature and all types of stuyot. So if you see somebody like that, you see somebody like Kabbalah Center, or sometimes you see rabbis. Rabbis, orthodox rabbis, that are teaching Kabbalah to the public. They tell you, Kabbalah Shiu, press here. Come. We have a new Kabbalah Shiur at our local shul. Everyone is uh, welcome. Run away. Not there. Run away. Why? Kabbalah is not something you teach to the public. If he says he's teaching Kabbalah to the public, either he's a liar or he's a Meshugana. Something's missing. Why? You don't teach Kabbalah to the public. Why? Because the average person in the world does not even know the 39 Melachot of Shabbat. 39 melachot, there's 39 restrictions on Shabbat. That if you violate one of them, not all 39, you violate one of them, you go to Genom. Meaning, it's not like you violate one of them and Hashem is going to say, you know what, you kept 38, good for you, good for you, kid, you're okay, you're still in. You, you, you got it, you passed. You violate uh, two, three, no, no, good for you, kid, you got 36 right. You're okay, it doesn't say that. You drive on Shabbat, you have serious problems. Most people in the world, unfortunately, sometimes including religious people, do not know the 39 Melachot of Shabbat. Do not know the real dinim of the laws of Nida. Many religious women come to me and asking me different questions, and I say, wait a minute, how long have you been religious? He goes, no, I was born religious. I said, wait, and you don't know that you're not supposed to sleep in the same bed as your husband when you're Nida? What kala class did you attend? In the church? Where did you learn this? basic stuff people do not know basic stuff they don't know so you're going to go teach people that don't know the basics Kabbalah how? how how could it be but they're going why do they do it because there's a law in the Torah Shlomo Melech teaches us stolen water are sweeter we always want something that's not allowed to us, that's not available to us. If you remember, I told you there was a, uh, some goyim made a study about the attraction of men to a married woman. They took uh, two twins, two girls that were twins, identical twins. They, you can't tell the difference between them. And they asked a bunch of guys, which one do you find more attractive? Over 90% found the A more attractive than B. But there's no difference in the look. Say, so why did you find her more attractive? You go, no, she's just a lot more better looking. She's a lot better looking. She's too. After that, they show them the picture. The same exact person. What's the difference? The difference is the one that they picked, over 90% picked, happens to be married. Now, they didn't know that she's married. But they're in a shama. They yet knew she's married. And they picked her. We want stolen waters. We want stuff that's not allowed. So, unfortunately, some of the shysters, some of the criminals of the world also join the spiritual world and they know that people want stuff that is not available to them that sounds really foreign i remember in boca raton there was one guy 
I'm not even sure if he knew what Shabbat was. Forget about keeping Shabbat. I'm not sure if he knew what Shabbat was. But he went into the uh, uh, Sifriah and he picked a book out. He started reading into it. He started telling one of the, uh, one of the guys that actually knows Torah and Ashul about some Zohar that he started reading. And one of the Talmidim Chachamim in, in, in the Shul says to him, you're teaching it completely wrong. It doesn't mean what you say. You shouldn't be reading. He tells him outright, because you shouldn't be reading the Zohar. You're, you're not in the level to read the Zohar. He says, ah, all you people say that stuff. Why? You're trying to hide it from us. You think that you're better than us. That's why we're not allowed to, to read the Zohar. Only you people can read it. He goes, no, you're just not understanding it. But the guy doesn't know Aleph Bet. Doesn't know Bereshit Barai Lokim et HaShamayim Bet Haaretz. Doesn't know that, but he wants to go directly into the Zohar. Why? Because it's far away. Another time, unfortunately, I saw a rabbi come into that same exact community. And, uh, you know, they have guests, different rabbis. And then he wanted to entice that Keilah after Tefillah, after Arvi, to come learn with him. So what does he say? We're sitting there, everybody finished praying, everybody starts leaving. He goes, oh, guys, come on. We're going to have a shiur at such and such house. 45 minutes, pure zor. <laughs> That's what he said to them. 45 minutes, pure zor. Nothing but zor. Everybody all of a sudden is interested in the shiur Torah. Learn Parashat Shavua, learn Alachat Shabbat, learn Alachat Kashrut, learn how to make sure that your wife knows how to buy clothes, learn anything, no. But pure Zohar, everybody, show, follow up this guy. Now this guy's a criminal though. Even though he got, four, he got all these people to go to Shil Torah, he's a criminal. Why? He's teaching them something that they are not, if he's teaching them Bechal Zohar. Uh, it's hard for me to believe he's teaching them that, but nonetheless, if he's really teaching them that, it's a mistake. Why? You don't teach it to the public. Unless it's specific midrashim that are permissible to all. And to know which is which, you have to also know what's allowed, what's not allowed. You have to have a rabbi that's going to tell you what's allowed, what's not allowed. To learn the midrashim of the Zohar is not a problem. But to learn some of the more mystical things, some of the things that are more beyond the average person, that's going to confuse you. It could be very, very dangerous for certain people. But nonetheless, you're going to see a lot of people, especially in the olama chasidut, in the world of chasidut, well, they're going to start confusing you, but at the same time making you feel better about yourself. And tell you, listen, what are you doing? You touch over here. Oh, that's the Chokhmah. No, no, that's the Bina. No, that's the Reb. That's the, start calling all your body parts all types of names. You're like, what, are you, what is Chokhmah, Bina? What, what, what is this? No, no, that's the Malchut. That's the Malchut. Oh, it's the Malchut. I'm mele, oh, I'm mele, I'm Malchut. You start walking around, you're thinking you're Malchut. No, no. People start shaking your head, hey. That's the, my malchut. It's not a regular hand. It's the malchut. It's the malchut. No, no. But some woman came to me. She said, listen, I'm having, I'm, having a, I'm having a problem because my gvura is very weak. I said, who? What? <laughs> Excuse me? My gvura. It's all types of things that aren't Kabbalah. But who are you to say these things? Do you even know what they mean? What, you look them up on Wikipedia? Unfortunately, sometimes you see rabbis teaching these things. And the average folks start, start going to people and say, Oh, yeah, this is my Netzach, this is my Chesed, this is my Gvura, Manishma Gvura, Manishma Malchut. Who is this Malchut and who is this Gvura? And do you even know what you're saying, Bechlal? No, why? I have the whole drawing. I have a poster in my room, my bedroom. You mean this, the bedroom that you and your wife are in? You have that poster on? He goes, Yeah, it's a very expensive picture. I said, Hashem, you know, your wife, that she's married to you, that you have this poster in your. People do not know right or left. But unfortunately, they're learning all types of things. Why? Because it entices the Yetzirah. Yetzirah loves this type of Torah. Why does the Yetzirah love the Kabbalah Center or love the rabbis that teach things that are above and beyond the average folk's pay grade? Because all of that Torah goes to him. Everything that they're learning in the Kabbalah Center, everything that they're learning in these places that they teach the average Joe things that are above and beyond anything that's going to help him do tshuva, all of it gives the satan more power. It's not, not a single minute of that shiur's mitzvah. All of it goes to the sitracha. So the satan loves it. Hence the reason why you're never going to see the Kabbalah Center do a fundraiser. Never. Why? They have billions of dollars given to them without them ever asking for money. You're never going to see the guy that teaches Kabbalah ever short of money. Never short of it. And why? The Satan gives him so much money. He makes him feel good. He makes the people that follow him feel even better. 
the Malchut, the Gvura, the this one and that one, don't walk around. Why? Because they figure this guy's building a $30 million building every week. He must be doing something right. You're still speaking out of a $5 shul. He's building $30 million buildings. Of course, Hashem is blessing him much more than you. You're just jealous. But they don't realize that the Satan is very, very rich. So this Rabotai is the disclaimer. Disclaimer on delving into some of the topics we're going to talk about on your own. Uh, if I didn't learn this from my rabbi, I would not be able to either teach you this or even learn it myself. Now, this is from the parts of the Zohar that is permissible to the average person, especially if it's taught the right way. But nonetheless, you're going to see that some of the things that we're going to say, Be'ezrat Hashem, are deep and also a little different than usual. Some are the same nonetheless. Now, all of us have heard about the Mashiach. It's one of the Ikare Muna, it's one of the 13 principles of faith. The Rambam put together almost 900 years ago the 13 things that a Jew must believe. One of them is that the Mashiach will come. The Mashiach will come on any given day. Chachamim say, wait a minute. How could the Mashiach come on any given day if the Prophet says, that Eliyahu Navi has to come three days before him. This is confusing. How could the Mashiach come tomorrow if for him to come tomorrow, Mashiach would have had to arrive two days ago? So Khamim say that it's not for certain that the, Mash- that the Eliyahu Navi has to come three days before. That's one of the possibilities. But one of the other possibilities also for the Mashiach and Eliyahu and Abit, they come at the same time. This we've learned before. But what I'm going to tell you today is breaking news. Eliyahu and Avi is already here. Eliyahu and Avi is already here. Does that mean the Mashiach is going to come in three days from now? I don't know. All I can tell you for sure, Eliyahu and Avi is already here. According to the Zohar Kadosh, he's been here already for many years. Almost 20 years he's been here. How so? So, the last prophet that we had was Malachi. And Malachi says, last prophecy, he's the last prophet, and this is his last prophet uh, prophecy. In chapter 3, verse number 22 until the end 24 Zikhu Torat Moshe Avdi asher tziviti oto bechorev al kol Israel chukim u mishpatim He says Remember the Torah of Moshe my servant which I commanded him at Chorev for all of Israel its decrees and its statutes Chorev is another name for Mount Sinai He says, Behold, I send you Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Hashem. Awesome day of Hashem meaning the day Mashiach comes. And he will turn back to God the hearts of fathers with their sons and the hearts of sons with their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with utter destruction. So here is why the machlok between the Chachamim says, one says three days, because a different prophet says three days. But the prophet Micha says, I'm sending him Eliyahu Navi. He doesn't say days. That's what the Chachamim say here. It could be it comes together with Eliyahu Navi. It could be it comes three days before Eliyahu Navi. But we have another opinion. What's another opinion? He's already been here for a long, long time. And we're going to find out about that opinion. But this Eliyahu Navi, first, remember, when it has to do Mashiach, what's going to save you? Torah Moshe. You, keep, you do tshuva, you keep Torah, all that stuff? Okay, you're in good shape. Not, 
Read the rest of it. Why? It says, I'm going to send you Eliyahu Navi. What's Eliyahu Navi? Eliyahu Navi is going to help people do tshuva, turn their hearts of their fathers with their sons and the sons with their fathers back to Hashem. Or else I'm going to strike and destroy the land, destroy everything. So here we have a little bit of a explanation to do. Is Eliyahu Navi coming to help people do tshuva? If that's the case, three days is not enough. Anyone that's been coming to the Shulim for at least a few months, if not a few years, already knows that to do tshuva takes a very long time. Tshuva is not something, oh, I'm going to start keeping Shabbat this week. You're about tshuva now. It doesn't work that way. Okay, good. You're not going to go to Gainum forever because you said you're going to keep Shabbat this week and Bethlehem you keep it, but you're not considered a full Baal Tshuva. Why? Because first of all, you still have to fulfill the mitzvot. You didn't have time to fulfill the mitzvot in three days. Maybe it's Monday and, uh, and the Mashiach comes already on Thursday. You didn't have time to keep Shabbat even once. How are you about Tshuva for Shabbat? On the other hand, you still didn't... Uh, Stop wasting seed. You still didn't leave the Goya. You still didn't leave the Goy. You still didn't start eating kosher yet. You still don't even know what you don't know. You still didn't even learn to walk for more than a couple of days straight. How are you really about Chuba? Meaning, in order to fulfill the four steps of Chuba that the Rambam says in Ilchot Chuba, it has to take time. First, the person needs to stop sinning. Stopping the sins, all the sins, not only requires you to stop them, but you also have to know what they are. To know what they are takes time. Takes time. To know all of Allah Shabbat takes time. If you're going to re- read, if you're Safari, you're going to read Yalkut Yosef, it's three books just on Allah Shabbat. Even if you're a fast reader, it's going to take you a few months. At best. To memorize it, maybe a few years. You have to read it a few times sometimes. What about Kashrut? What about uh, Nida? What about the, uh, watching your eyes? What about midot? What about all the different things that you have to keep? You don't even know anything yet. How are you about to find three days? So that's why the Zohar Kadosh says that there are three types of arriving or uncovering and revealing of Eliyahu and Navi. Three different types. One is a man who suddenly gets the urge a woman that suddenly gets the urge out of nowhere to serve a kadosh Baruch Hu. out of nowhere he's keeping a few things he's learning a few things but out of nowhere he, she feels like i have to chesed i have to start giving hello to all of the poor people in the neighborhood yeah but you, you don't even know how to make hala yet. i'll learn how to make hala just so i can give it to all of the poor people in the neighborhood all of a sudden she wants to be uh the biggest tzaddikah in the world from where did this come from? Oh, I'm going to give CDs. I'm going to arrange shurim. I'm going to get everybody to do shuret Torah. Shuret Torah? Do you even know a rabbi? No, but I'll find a rabbi and I'll bring him here and he's going to help everybody do shuva. Where did you get this energy from all of a sudden? Where did this come from, lady? You, you don't, don't, don't ruin anything. I'm going to keep, you come to the shuret Torah too. All of a sudden, you're the biggest tell me there. But you don't even know why. Who? Where did this come from? All of a sudden, she's zealous for Hashem. Why? All of a sudden, the guy's like, hey, rabbi, listen, I want to learn Gemara. Gemara, why? You keep Shabbat yet? I'm starting this week. Baruch Hashem, what made you? I don't know, I saw a video, it was three and a half minutes, and I want to do everything now. All of a sudden, the guy, Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Akiva, he wants to take everything on. Where does this urge come from? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, in the Zohar, page 123, Aleph, that this is one of the revealings of Eliyahu Navi. Personal revealing in your mind. Eliyahu Navi is enticing the person to serve a Kadosh Bahu to a high level. Supernatural. All of a sudden, he wants to do some things that he didn't want to do his whole life. All of a sudden, he wants to do tshuva, but 100%. All of a sudden, she throws out all of our clothes in one day. She hears a shiur for seven minutes. Rabbi says, You're not allowed to be immodest. She goes to a house, she takes all the clothes that she has in the, in the, in the closet. Throws it all in the garbage, burns it, makes a YouTube video of her burning all of her clothes. She hasn't even bought clothes yet. She has her jacket from the winter that she wears until she buys clothes. That's Ilya Navi. Second, sometimes a person learns. Once in a while you get Baruch Hashem people that learn Torah. And all of a sudden, 
he's learning regular. He's learning his Shtaymi Kaychat Targum. He's learning his, uh, his Parashat Shavua. He's learning his Gemara, his Daf Yomi. He's been an average guy for a few years. Nothing special. He's not giving any major shiurim. He's just an average guy. But all of a sudden, his Torah, he's learning. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. He says, you know what? Instead of going to sleep, I'm going to push for another half hour. Sleep for actually less half hour. I'll push a little bit more. He goes another 20 minutes, another 25 minutes. At 29 minutes, at 2.29 at night, all of a sudden, the whole page that he's been learning becomes like the movie The Matrix. He sees the whole blueprint. He has a chidush that connects this sefer to some sefer that he read 15 years ago. Another sefer that's on the shelf that he barely even delved into, but it happens to know the one page in it. All types of things, and he has a chidush that the world has never seen before. No one's ever heard these uh, these words since Mount Sinai. He has this chidush. That's another uncovering of Ilya Navi. The third and highest level is Ilya Navi Mamash, where a person sees Ilya Navi. Now there are some people that have told their stories. To Rabbi again and other uh, Chachamim, where they saw Eliyahu Navi. For example, Rabbi again's grandfather saw Eliyahu Navi a couple of times. Also, you had a couple of Talmidim that saw Eliyahu Navi in different ways. One time there was a uh, guy that told him, Listen, Kvod Arav, one of his Avrechim in the call, it says, Kvod Arav, you got to meet my Chavruta. He saw Eliyahu Navi. Okay. I like people that say they saw Eliyahu Navi. And he says, okay, let me talk to him. So, he says, yeah, but he's learning. Is this, is that. One day he goes to the court. He goes, Kvod Arav, that's him. Talk to him. So this guy says, I'm going to tell you the story. He says, no, no. I want to know every detail. Don't miss a point. Not too much, not too little. I want to know exactly what happened. He goes, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. I was born, Herzl Kna'ani. The worst possible name in the Torah, maybe. Other than Esav. Herzl Kna'ani. That's what this guy, the Kofer, but also from Kna'an. But today I think his name was um, Yaakobi or something. They changed it to a kosher, kosher uh, Jewish name. He says he didn't know anything. He didn't know anything. And uh, one day suddenly he decided he got some uh, desire to check what else is in the world and so on. And little by little started delving into the world of Torah. And he made a uh, minag. What is the minag? That every day at a specific time he's going to learn Torah no matter what. No matter what. And he had this minag for a few years. Now you're supposed to make 18 for Torah. You have to learn Torah every day at the same time. But he had this thing where he would learn Torah at a specific time, like he's supposed to. But one day, as the Satan would have it, he always likes to mess around. He gives this guy a tikkun and he uh, tells him he can't learn at that specific time. He has to go to uh, somewhere that he really didn't have to go. So he says, okay, I have to go. I can't learn. I mean, I already have this minag for, for a few years, but okay, but said, what can I do? So he goes on a bus and he starts walking to the back of the bus. He notices there's nobody on the bus. And he gets to the back, to the back, to the back. And he sees there's an old man with a baby face. And he gets scared to death, but he doesn't know what to do. He can't turn around because he's too scared. He's scared to go forward, but he doesn't know. He just sits down, which happens to be right next to the old man with the baby face. You know, sometimes you have certain people, they're older, but they have a baby face. He said, I was so scared because I knew he's not from here. I'm scared to look up, but then I hear a voice, this beautiful voice. He says to me, you are such and such, Yaakobi, right? He says, yes. He goes, you weren't born, Yaakobi. You were born Herzl Knan, right? He says, yes. He said, you have a shiur today, at this time, right? He says, yeah. He goes, why'd you cancel it? Oh, I have to go, never do it again. We like your shiurim in Shemaim. We like your learning at this time in Shemaim. Never do it again. And he started telling them all the types of details with specific time of when the Mashiach can come. 
And he says, just to make sure you know it's real, when you go home, you go home, you can tell your wife, you can tell people that you saw me, you can tell people that I told you certain things, but not the details of Mashiach, though. And to verify that you're not losing your mind, your ear, he touched his ear, he goes, your ear is going to blow up. It's going to be really, really big, but don't worry, it's going to go away. And he tells Rabbi again, is I went home, I wasn't sure what happened, all of a sudden my wife screams, she goes, what happened to your ear? I go to the mirror, I see my ear is five times the size. She says, oh, I guess it's real. I told my wife and so on and so forth. So there's different strange stories like this of different people seeing Eliyahu and Avim Mamash. As even in the Gemara, some of the Chachamim that saw Eliyahu and Avi, sometimes as a poor man, sometimes as a different thing, but point being is that there is three different types of uncovering of Eliyahu and Avi. Now, the Rambam writes in Halakha something unique. In Ilchot Melachim, chapter 12, Halakha number 2. He talks about the days of Mashiach. He talks about something that many people do not know, apparently. I personally have never heard this in a shiul. Doesn't mean that I've seen every shiul, but I haven't heard this before. It says, Amru Chachamim, En ben haolam hazeh limot ha-mashiach, ela sheibud malchuyot bilvad says, our sages taught there will be no difference between the current age and the messianic era except the emancipation of our subjugation to the Gentile kingdoms. In so many words, we're not going to be under the control of Donald Trump, Bibi Netanyahu, the lefty liberals, the homosexuals, all of these reshaim in the world. We're not going to be under their control in the world. Mashiach is going to be the king of the world. You're not going to see any more gay parades. You're not going to see all of this uh, filthy, disgusting uh, billboards that you see everywhere. You're not going to see anybody going against the Shem. The time of Mashiach. But he says, "Mipshutan shel divrei anevim, shebetchilat yemot Mashiach tiye milchemet gogu magog, veshekode milchemet gogu magog yamod navi leyasher Yisraelu laachin libam." He says. The simple interpretation, the pshat of the prophet's words of this verse that I just read to you in Malachi 3.22 that says uh, about, uh, behold, I'm sending you Eliyahu Navi. He says, what's the pshat? The simple interpretation of the prophet's words appears to imply that the war of Gogu Magog, the final war, the third world war, the war where the prophets say two-thirds of the world will die instantly and the last ter- third will be refined like Hashem refines gold and silver, meaning not all of the third that are left will, be, uh, will, be, uh, will, will survive, but two-thirds for sure are dead. That's what the prophet says. That's what Kadosh Baruch Hu says. So this Milchemet Gogu Magog, you want to see details of Milchemet Gogu Magog, go to Zechariah chapter 14, you see the details, it defines a nuclear war and a biochemical war at the same time. You see how he says that one guy reaches his hand to his friend, the friend reaches the arm and takes off his arm. Another guy looks at his friend while he sees his friend's face melt and the eyes start pouring out like liquid. What is this from? This is a nuclear and biochemical war. In the times that this was written, 3,000 years ago, the biggest weapon was a spear. What did you have there? You didn't have nuclear weapons, which obviously shows that this is prophecy of the end of the days. So this is the war of Gogu Magog. But he says that the prophet talks about the war of Gogu Magog. It will take place at the beginning of the Messianic age. But before the war of Gogu Magog, before the war of Gogu Magog, a prophet will arise to inspire Am Yisrael to be upright and prepare their hearts to do tshuva. Meaning, there's a prophet, not Eliyahu Navi. He doesn't say Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi he says later on. He says, there's going to be a prophet. It's going to be Yamod Navi. Yamod Navi. And there's going to be a prophet that comes. And he's going to help Am Yisrael do tshuva.
before the war of Gog Magog. Once the war of Gog Magog comes, after all hell breaks loose, eventually the Mashiach will come during the war and win the war for Am Yisrael, but unfortunately, a lot of havoc will happen in between, which we'll discuss momentarily. And then he says, Some say that Eliyahu Navi is going gonna, is gonna to come. So why is there a difference here? Once he says there's going to be a Navi, another he says Eliyahu Navi. Hence the Chidush. A Navi comes from the word Niv, Niv Spataim. Niv Spataim means someone who's a speaker, someone who gives Shurim. And what the Rambam is saying is that as far as the prophet that's going to come, says in, in regards to Eliyahu Navi, he's not coming, it's not him per se that he's going to come directly to purify the impure or declare the impure pure. He's not going to dispute the lineage of the presumed. He's not going to do the job of the Mashiach. First is going to be the job of helping Am Yisrael do tshuva. Then it's going to be the job of declaring that Mashiach is here in three days. Meaning that there's two jobs for this prophet. Two jobs for the prophet. The job of announcing the Mashiach is the second job, which pretty much at that point, that's the end. No more tshuva after that point. But before that, during the early days of Mashiach, which is where we are today, there's going to be a prophet that's going to help people do tshuva. What's a prophet? Not someone that says prophecy of the future, but rather someone who's a Navi, who needs Fatim, someone that gives shurim. Someone or someones. Who's those someones? Anyone that helps Am Yisrael do tshuva is called a Navi. People that help Am Yisrael do tshuva, not people that help people get their uh, bank accounts a little smaller. People that help people do tshuva, that's the job of the Navi. Now, the Rav Ephraim knew a Rav by name of Rav El Maliach, who was the Rabbi of Dimona. Zechet Tzadik Vivacha. This Rav came to Rav Ephraim one time and he told him that he brought this Rambam to Rav Ovadia. He says, For the Rav, you see here, this is you. You're speaking to Am Yisrael to get him to do tshuva. So Bezat Hashem, you're going to be the one. You're the one that's telling people to do tshuva. The Bezat Hashem, we're also going to see the end of this Rambam. It says the Mashiach is going to come and everything is going to be good eventually. So Rav Ephraim says, so what did Rav Avadiyah say? So Rav Avadiyah didn't say anything, he just smiled. He just smiled. Now, we don't have Rav Avadiyah anymore. We don't have the Lubavitcher Rebbe anymore. We don't have Rav Eliashiv anymore. We don't have Gdolei Yisrael. We don't have Arav Yagen anymore. We don't have all of the Gdolim from the past. What do we have? We have an obligation to still fulfill the verse. We still have an obligation to fulfill this Alakha. And what is fulfilling the Alakha? To be Nif Sfatayim. To tell people and to do things to help people to do Tshuva. That is still our obligation. Now, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 19, says, Shalom, shalom, l'rachok v'lakarov. Says, shalom, shalom, we could mean hello, but also mean peace, to the one that's far and to the one that's close. Chachamim say, why is he saying, peace will be, or hello to someone that's far, but also someone that's uh, close. Meaning, you're saying someone that's not religious, hello to him first, and someone that's religious... Second, why well, he says, worry about the guys that are not religious too. Get them to become religious. Get them to be a karov. Meaning, it's not just about worrying about the religious people. You have to also worry about the not religious people. Why? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Zohar, 
Tikkuni Hazor, page 123a. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says to Eliyahu Navi, Rise and praise Hashem. And you will arrive before all of the prophets in the generation of Mashiach. He says to Eliyahu Navi, Get up! And praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu because you are the one that's going to come before all of the other prophets. Before there's reincarnation, there's um, resurrection of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Zechariah, of Yeremiah, of all of the tzaddikim from the past, you're going to come before everyone else. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, how is this Eliyahu Navi going to come before everyone else? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says he's going to come in three different ways as we described one, he's going to be revealed to a person in his own mind by a sudden urge to do Avodat Hashem. Two, he's going to be suddenly appear in a person's mind, giving him a chidus, giving him a Torah insight that he got out of his learning, but he knows that under no way in the world would he have gotten it with his own mind. Why? He doesn't have that type of mental capacity. He may be smart, he may be smart, but he's not that smart. That he's going to figure out something that has never been written before, but it's true. A lot of people say a bunch of things that never existed before, but they're all lies, nonsense. But he's saying, you're going to come up with a chidush that's never been said before, and it's true. It's emit. It agrees with all of the chachamim. That's the second way Eliyahu Navi could appear. But third way is Eliyahu Navi himself. But just as a footnote, Rabbi Fahim says, that second one, that chidush, can never happen to an arrogant person. So if you're arrogant, forget about Eliyahu Navi coming. Why? Because in order for it, this chidush to be from Eliyahu Navi, you have to agree that it came from something that's beyond your mental capacity, that you in your natural way cannot figure out such a thing. It's so big. If you're arrogant, you're never going to think that anything is beyond you. You're going to think, well, Chidushim, you know how many I have? I have a whole book of Chidushim. The Rambam is asking me for questions now. Eh, Chidushim, you know how many Chidushim I have? People think that uh, the, everything that, that comes out of their, uh, their head is a, is a new insight. An arrogant person can never have such a thing. Now, the way that Eliyahu and Avi will be uncovered it's going to bring a renewed spirit of heaven on Am Yisrael little by little, bit by bit through these different ways to sudden urges, all of a sudden your next door neighbor, Baal Tshuva. Last week he was making barbecues on Shabbat. This week he's a Hasid Chabad. Next guy, last week he was married to who knows what. This week, Ishtabach Shimo, the guy says, when's the minyan? Last week she was walking around with, you weren't sure if it was underwear or it was actually closed. This week she's a chasida, she has kisu rosh and everything. She's telling, did you watch the new wig video? It's really, wigs shouldn't allow it. She's telling you shurim about wigs, what happened? Where did this come from? This renewed spirit that's coming onto Am Yisrael will come little by little. Different chachamim will come out with different chidushim little by little. The renewed spirit of heaven will come on Am Yisrael bit by bit and through this they will do tshuva and get accustomed to serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu and prepared for the salvation to be uncovered. As it says by the prophet Amos, Hine yamim ba'im ne'um Adonai Elohim v'yishlachti ra'av ba'aretz the prophet Amos in chapter 8, verse number 11, says, Ineyamim ba'im, Behold, the days are coming. The word of the Lord Hashem, when I will send hunger into the land, not a hunger for bread and not a thirst for water, but to hear the words of Hashem. It says, before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a sudden hunger in the world. Not a hunger for food. Why? There's going to be Shefa. Everyone's going to be rich. No one is starving to death in the streets of America anymore. No one is starving to death in the modern society anymore. 
Some people may be a little hungry because they want two burgers instead of one, but generally speaking, no one's dying of hunger in the modern society in the world. It's the opposite. Right now, the average guy eats what the tzaddikim used to eat for Shabbat maybe once a month. He eats it every day. People are eating meat every day. Like it's lechat chilash, you should eat it. Tzaddikim used to eat meat maybe once a week for Shabbat. Today we're eating it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're going to say, what did you have for breakfast? Oh, you only had eggs? You didn't have the bacon on there too? You didn't have the chazir on there? You didn't have the non-kosher? All that stuff? No. Ah, you religious people are fanatic. The guy is eating swine in the morning. He doesn't realize what Hashem is. Bechal. But suddenly, this hunger is not going to be a hunger for food anymore. It's not going to be a hunger for water anymore. It's going to be a hunger for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's going to be a hunger for Torah. Now you're seeing a little bit now. Baruch Hashem, you see in the world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu invented the internet. People like to contribute these inventions to people. It's completely ridiculous. He just makes it look realistic by giving the, uh, uh, putting a person's name on it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu invented the internet. Now unfortunately the internet, most people don't know, originally it was a government project. But it went to the public. Why did it go to the public? Pornography sites. The original websites were only pornography sites. That's how it became popular. But why did Kadosh Baruch Hu let this happen? Let the Rishayim do what they want to do. Why? Let them build it, build it, so that Sadiqim can learn Torah today, 40 years later. Do tshuva from YouTube. Do tshuva from BeZadHashem.org. Do tshuva from some guy that was himself about tshuva a few years ago. Somebody in Australia is going to watch you today. Somebody from Morocco is watching this you right now. Morocco. Never in your wildest dreams are you going to meet this guy or this woman in Morocco or in Philippines, in Australia, in Holland, in all these different places. They're watching the Shurim live right now with you guys. They probably have even better view than you. They're watching the Shurim right now from all over the world. Even the Chazonish, the Ben Ishchai, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, they didn't have that such, such a uh, magnitude. Why? They didn't have internet. The Ben Ishchai, when he taught people, 10,000 people. That's a lot of people. I'll violate 10,000 people. But he was capped out of 10,000. That shoe started and ended at the shoe. Someone came the next day and said, I want to hear the shoe. So said, oh, you have to come next time. Why? Well, she was over. Today you have a shoe to life. For Kadosh Baruch Hu wants, he can spread that shoe to every single corner in the world. When? At a time that suddenly people want to learn to life. Suddenly people want to learn Torah. Suddenly all types of people want to know who Hashem is. Want to know what happened before we were here. And know that they're smart enough that we didn't come for monkeys. Know that we're not going to turn into dust because then there's no point to life. There has to be something. This neshama that's in every single one of us is going somewhere. And this is not the end nor the beginning. People want to know. How is this book still famous, this Torah book still famous 3,300 years later. Today, a book is not famous for a week. The guy publishes before, before, he, uh, before he sells his first copy, the publisher says, it's out of print. Why? We, we decided to discontinue it. We didn't sell enough. Very few people make it to the market. The only time you're going to see their books is in a library because somebody uh, just gave it away to them for free. Nobody wants the book, but Torah... Still the bestseller from the beginning of time until the end of time. How is this book still a bestseller with so many people making fun of it? So many people are making fun of it, but yet it's the bestseller in the world. It's still the only one that motivates people to change their life. <laughs> you could read Harry Potter 50 million times. It's still never going to change your life. You're never going to be stupid enough to take a, a, a broom and start flying on it from your 8th floor. You're never going to take the broom, jump out of your 8th floor and says, Go, Harry! You're never going to do that. Why? Because you know it's a fake stupid book. You're never going to start taking your wife's ring. Honey, give me your engagement ring. Why? I want to see. Precious, precious. Lord of the Rings. The precious. Your wife's going to divorce you a week later. What precious, you chamo? What precious? Give me my ring back. You're never going to change your life because of the ring. You're never going to change your life because of all the shtuyot. But if you read the Kadosh Baruch Hu's book, you change your life. 
Anyone that reads, anyone that reads the Torah with an objective mind from beginning to end with commentary, meaning they understand what the Chachamim said for each Pasuk, not trying to translate it from their own stupid mind. They read it from beginning to end and understand what it says, their life changes. Guaranteed. Why? That's the power of the Torah. No other book in the world could be like that. No other book. Despite the fact that so many people make fun of it. Despite the fact that so many people mock it. That's how you see that there's something divine about this book. It's not just a bunch of ink on pieces of paper. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us, before I'm going to bring you Mashiach, suddenly people are going to want to read this book. Suddenly people are going to be interested. What does this book say? Why is it so special? It's so old, but so interesting. There's going to be a hunger. Meaning that Eliyahu Navi is going to come in different forms, little by little, to different neighborhoods and different countries and different neighborhoods in different cities. No matter where you are, I have a Talmud in Iran. Iran. I don't even know how he watches internet. In Iran. I have one guy in Korea. I'm not sure if it's north or south, but I know neither one of them is so good right now. A few people in China. One guy sent me an email today from China. China. All types of wonderful people, they want to know what Hashem said. I happen to say what Hashem says in our shoe. Hashem, we make good friends. Rabotai, there's a sudden hunger for Torah. But now, the question is, how come HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not just going to suddenly send Eliyahu Navi? Now, surprise, I'm here. Come. With his four wings, it's got four wings. Shh, arrive here in where where we were, sunny isles. Middle of the shoe, see the the ceiling open up. Everybody runs. Ah! Special effects. And the Yawana V arrives. Let's go, guys. We should make a movie out of this. And the Yawana V arrives. How come not suddenly? Why? Because that's not the way that Eliyahu Navi is going to come. Why? Why is Eliyahu Navi going to come suddenly? Why does it have to be? Little by little, little by little, before that great day that he's going to announce finally, <coughs> Mashiach is coming. Or Mashiach is here. So the Zohar Kadosh continues. The reason why Eliyahu Navi is not going to arrive suddenly is because if he arrives suddenly and Am Israel did not already do tshuva, they would be judged to death, Rahmana Litzlan, like all of the haters of Am Israel. As it says in the end of that Pasuk by Malachi chapter 3, verse 24, Penavo vikiti et aretz cherem. Lest I come and I strike the land with utter destruction. What's destroyed? Mashiach comes, the end. Whoever hasn't done tshuva by that time of announcement, there's no more time for tshuva. No, no, I'm going to keep tshuva now. Sorry, too late. No, no, I'm going to leave her. No, sorry. No, I'm going to watch my eyes. Yeah, you're going to watch your eyes drip out of your face. No, but I was a good person. To who? How could you be a good person but an enemy of a Kadosh Baruch Hu? How? Zohar Kadosh says the reason why Eliyahu Navi doesn't come suddenly is because if Hashem and Hashem, if he came suddenly, all of us are questionable. Because who knows if we really did Shuvah yet? Who knows if we really did Shuvah yet? Therefore, Kadosh Baruch Hu is trying to give us time. The Zohar Kadosh continues in page 134a in Tikkunah Zohar. And he says some interesting things that are going to happen before this final announcement. In a generation of the end of the exile, the generation of Mashiach, the people will be like the ones from Sodom and Gomorrah. Homosexuality, chutzpah, stinginess, insulting chachamim, insulting each other, disgusting behavior. 
This is like reading the newspaper. I went to CVS to pick up some medicine for my kid the other day. I saw there was a newspaper on the counter. Hashem Yirachem. There was another school shooting right next to it. There's some other garbage. Just the cover of the newspaper, you want to just say, Hashem, how are you not destroying the world? It's already worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. A little kid, little kid is shooting up a bunch of other kids for no reason. In America, on the average, every week there's a school shooting. At one point it was every two, three days. I'm not sure if that statistic is still valid, because last year they had over 300 shootings. Every 300 shootings. No other country in the world has such a thing. Land of the free, Alik. Free what? Free to get killed just to go to school. You go to school, you learn you came from a monkey. You survive the day, maybe someone's going to shoot you anyway. I'm not sure which one's worse. Imagine your whole life you thought your grandfather's a monkey, but you never went to the zoo to visit him. Zohar Kadosh says that the generation before Mashiach is going to be disgusting. Homosexuality, chutzpah, stinginess. A friend of Rabbi Ephraim went to a mayor in Eretz Yisrael. Shem Yirachem, Shem Yirachem. This guy was a gvir, had some money, and he would raise money from different people to open a bet uh, a place to feed the homeless. And he comes to the mayor, he says, listen, I'm going to open a building over here. I'm going to buy the building with my money. I'm going to feed the homeless and the poor with my money. I just need you to give me permission. The mayor of the city says, on my dead body, you're going to open this place. He says, no, no, no. I'm not asking the government for any money. I'm not asking the mayor to give me any money. I'm going to buy the building with my money. I'm going to feed the people with my money. And on top of that, I'm going to hire the people from the town. So the town benefits, people make money. She says, on my dead body, you're going to open this place. He says, why? He says, what? You're going to make a place to feed homeless people so they can bring their other homeless friends into our town and ruin our beautiful city? He says, what beautiful city? You have 100,000 people that are broke. 100,000 people that are homeless here. 100,000 people are starving to death in your own city. At least let's feed them. He says, no, 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 then there's going to be more. Don't feed the homeless, let them die. What, who had this rule? Sodom and Gomorrah had this rule. You weren't allowed to feed the homeless. Lot's daughter fed a homeless guy. What they do? They put her on a pedestal, they tied her up, they released a bunch of bees until they killed her. That's why Kadosh Baruch when he said to Avram, I heard the scream from Sodom. What was the scream? Lot's daughter. Lord's daughter was a tzaddikah. She wanted to do something good. She saw a homeless guy. She wanted to feed him. She says, what, are you feeding him? Oh, we're going to feed you to a bunch of bees. You want to be sweet? We're going to put uh, honey on you. And from all the akitzot, all of the stinks from the bees, it was poisonous. They killed her. Why? You are not allowed to feed the homeless. Like this reshait over here. That stopped our friend from opening a betam chui. A place to feed the homeless. There's a law here in Florida. My wife just told me the other day, she's an original Floridian. She says, you know, in Florida, there's a law that passed recently. So what's the law? It says, if you go to a traffic light, you see a homeless guy. He has a sign. He says, please give me money. You give him money, they give you a fine. If there's a cop over there that has your number, he sees you, you give money to some guy in, a, in the corner where the traffic light is, he's going to give you a fine. $500 fine. Maybe even go to jail. For what? For giving a dollar to some homeless guy. You want to be a nice guy. You go to jail, spend the night in jail. What law is this? Solomon Gomorrah. Solomon Gomorrah. Now everyone's going to think twice. Should I give the homeless? Should I not give the homeless? Shem Yilachem. All of us have to start right now. All of us have to start right now. Should I give the homeless? Not give the homeless. Meaning, we may be participants in Solomon Gomorrah right now. Shem Yilachem. You see a homeless person, give it to them. Don't be stupid. Kadosh Baruch Hu will protect you from mitzvot. Now, this filth of a world that will exist before Mashiach, Hashem will get us out of it. Will save us from here. But, 
Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai continues and he says, the sins will fill the land. The filth of the sins will be everywhere. There's not going to be a single space in the world. There's not going to be sins and filth of sins. Where are these sins coming from? The Erev Rav, who are the children of the Satan himself. Wait a minute, but they're Jews. He says, yes, exactly. There are some Jews that are considered in Shemaim children of the Satan and his wife. And they're called Sehor and Chametz in Shemaim. Chametz meaning something you don't want on Pesach. And before the end, before Mashiach comes, they're going to defile the land. They're going to ruin the land. Now I'm going to tell you some of the things before we continue with the Zohar of what the Gemara says about what's going to happen before Mashiach comes. The Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 49b. Amar Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinos. Rabbi Eliezer Gadol. Rabbi Eliezer was the rabbi of Rabbi Akiva. He says, Bikvot Mishicha Chutzpa is gay. In a period that will precede the coming of the Mashiach, Chutzpa will increase. Average guy comes, sees the rabbi, doesn't even stand up, sits in his chair. Hey, what's up? Calls the rabbi in yeshiva like he's his boy. Or best yet, calls him by his first name. Hey, Steve. How you doing? How was your Shabbos? Chutzpan. Calls his rabbi by first name and thinks it's a good thing. Guy calls his father by first name. Instead of saying Abba, instead of kissing his hand, instead of kissing his mother's hand, what does he do? Calls him by first name. Hey, Sarah, where's the car? Abba knows. You mean David? David knows. Calls his parents by first name, Chutzpan Magail. Disgusting behavior of this generation. In my generation, when I was a kid, if I ever called my father by first name, you'd never see me here. I'd still be in the same cage today. <laughs> Call my father by first name, sit in his seat. Shem Yerachem Aleinu. You don't have to be religious to know that. You don't have to be religious to know that. People call rabbis by first names. No shame whatsoever. Call their parents by first names. Call their teachers by first names. One guy came to an interview one time in my office. Wanted a job. So I'm talking to him. And I said, okay, so tell me a little bit about yourself. This chutzpan, what does he do? He's 20 nothing years old. And he sits back. He sees me sitting back and I'm waiting for him to talk. He sits back and puts his feet on my desk. He goes, I want to be like you. I want to be like your job, like this. I said, you don't even have the job. Out. Put his feet on my desk. Felt at home. He's probably still homeless today, maybe, with that kind of attitude. Chutzpanim. Gemara continues, says that the uh, cost will soar. There's been inflation. When I was a kid, Dollar, dollar fifty, you buy a gallon of milk. Today, six, seven, eight dollars. Cookies, dollar, dollar fifty. You guys sell a pack of cookies today, five ninety nine. You feel special if you got a twofer. It's like, honey, honey, how many cookies do you want? One. Well, let's get eighteen. Why? It's two for one. We'll just save for the for the winter. It's already winter. Yeah, for next year. We're saving half price. We're only paying four dollars each because it's two for one. The vine will yield its fruit, yet wine will be dear. Wine today, you want to get good quality wine? $20, $30, $40, $50, $100 $100 for good quality wine. Stuff you buy for $7, $8, sometimes it's good, sometimes not. It's 50 50 shot. You're either going to do kiddush, drink and say, oh, the chayim, you say, oh, Hashem, Yachem, Aleinu, what kind of wine? You're not sure. Why? Because you only spend $8 on the wine. 
Sometimes wine is eight dollars perfectly fine. The problem is it turns to vinegar pretty quickly though. You want good quality wine, costs a lot more money. But what if you don't have the money? What if you don't have fifty dollars to spend on wine? Wine is dear. It says the government will turn it to heresy. It says the gov what does the government have to do with heresy? It says the government is gonna be a place where people watch the news. And from watching the news, they'll become heretics. Why? They're going to give power to Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump, during the time that he existed as a president, that Hashem allowed it to happen, it happens to be the best economic shape that America has been in in many years. And people are contributing it to Donald Trump. Or during the time of Bibi Netanyahu, such and such happened in the Israeli economy, and therefore they're contributing it to Bibi Netanyahu. Watching the news will make religious people heretics. But even more so, the government will be heretical itself, it says. Like this Rasha Merusha from Tveria, who made it his number one mission in life to turn Tveria into a place that's anti-Torah. He's spending government money, government money, to... Make sure that everybody drives on Shabbat. Make sure that the whole parks, all the stores are open. He's bringing snow from different places so people, all tourists will come to Tveria on Shabbat. Going against the rabbis. Now he's going to have a special, this Rasha Merusha. This Kobi. This guy who doesn't even know how to say Kiddush. He made a video of himself making Kiddush as if he's like semi-religious. He doesn't know how to say Kiddush for Shabbat, this Rasha. He made a... Uh, headlines again re- a few days ago. What he's gonna have there's a uh, special place named in Tveria named after Ravadia, named after Ravadia for Kavod Ravadia, Kadosh Elyon. He says, Over there, we're gonna sell Christmas trees. We're gonna sell Christmas trees over there. What do you think? That he's the only one this Rasha. Our friend, Rasha Merusha, Mirvis, made headlines again. Mirvis Amenuval made headlines again. Why did he make headlines again? Chief Rabbi of UK, Miskenim. Chief Rabbi attends mosque for mitzvah day activity. Saying, this is what the world should be like all the time. Is here mitzvah with a sheikh. Here, Mirvis, Rabbi, Orthodox Rabbi, Kailu. Here is with a Sheikh. Over here he says, this is Mitzvah Day. Mitzvah Day, we're going to a mosque. We're making a huge statement. Rabbi Ephraim Mirvis declares, I thank all our brothers and sisters in the Muslim community for joining in the initiative. Sadly, the people that put him in power and leave him in power are worse than him. Why? They keep him there. They keep him there. The Gemara continues. What you just heard, you're not going to see anywhere else. Why? Because the Gemara says, aside from the government turning to heresy, there will be no rebuke. People that tell the truth are going to be very few. In the English-speaking world, you could count it on a single hand, maybe. Single hand, maybe. Why? Because even the people that want to say the truth, Hashem, Yachem, Satan, takes revenge against them. Rav alone, another God bless him, almost died a, f- a few weeks ago. Satan goes, Mamas, hardcore. You guys have no idea what I have to deal with every day just to make it to a shield. If you saw it, you say, honestly, I don't know if it's worth it. You tell me, I don't know if it's worth it. You have no idea what Rabbi Mizrahi has to deal with every single day just to do a shiur. You have no idea what anybody that's going to, mamash, putting Mesirut Nefesh, but mamash, putting their life on the line just to make a shiur Torah. You have no idea what we have to deal with. People send you five million questions a day. And then you finally give them all the answers that they want, and they still do the opposite. Or better yet, 
Oh, Kvod Arav, you're the best. You may help me do tshuva. I did this, I did this, I did this, and I just donated $500 to a different place. He's saying, Ribono Sheolam, are you stupid or just dumb? Like, which one is it? I don't understand. If you're, you're saying, you're saying, not me, I said it. You're saying, I helped you, I saved you, I did all of this. Why are you donating to somebody else? It's people don't even know anything. You lose your mind. You lose your mind. Then the best part is, after you help them, they go against you. Like this Menuval that was here in the shoe a few times. He calls different people from the shoe on a regular basis. No, don't come to the shoe anymore. Why? That's what happens. But you keep going. Why? You're not working for him. You're not working for the Rishayim. You're working for the people that want to know Torah. But that's also part of the reason why even the ones that say the truth... Are hard to find new ones. It's hard to find new ones. Why? Because even if somebody wants to come tell the truth, you start seeing that they can't they can't withstand the tests. I know a couple of guys, a couple of guys started that were doing really, really good, disappeared off the face of the earth. So what happened to your YouTube videos? Well, no, no, I can't do it. Why not? I don't know. Ever since I started doing Shurim, all of a sudden I got all these problems, this Shlom Bayit problems, kids' problems, health problems, that problem, that problem. I said, Yeah, but keep going. Salvation's in the car, people need you. He goes, No, 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 can't do it. I got a couple of guys, maybe two, three guys that I know. Mama, tell me that. I don't want you to speak. You speak English. In Hebrew, Baruch Hashem, there's plenty. There's plenty of tell me that. I teach Torah at Semet. In Hebrew, there's not that many. No, teach. Tell people. Shabbat, this, that. He goes, no, I don't know. No, no, I don't know. 500 times I've told. You have to convince people to give Shuret Torah. Why? He's like, ah, listen, I did one time and the rabbi yelled at me because I said this about that. I said, who cares what he says? It's the truth. You say it. It's hard. It's hard. Rebuke is not just because people don't want to do it. It's even the ones that want to do it are having a hard time. So the rabbi comes to Akila, tells him, by the way, Rabotai, from now on, we're closing the parking lot for the shul on Shabbat. They fire him the next day. They fire him the next day. A dear friend of mine told me, listen, I invite you to come give shulim in my Bekneset, not because I, can't, I don't say what you say. I say it, but I only say it to a few people. I can't say it to the whole Kila. Because if I said it to all Kila, I'd lose my job. If I tell everybody everything you said, they fire me the next day. But I bring you. Why? They'll listen to you, but they won't listen to me. They won't fire you. Why? You're only coming for a day, for a few hours. But it's Sadiq. Why? He knows it's Kila. He's still going to bring the Emet to them, just in a different way, in a clever way. Guy asked me the other day, listen, I'm thinking of moving to a different place. I'm not sure if there's enough Torah there, this, that, all these different types of questions. I said, are you going to be the rabbi there? He said, yeah. I said, it's Makom Torah then. You go there. He goes, yeah, but there's only one yeshiva there, and it's only one this there, it's only one there. I said, are you going to teach over there? He said, yeah. I said, your head is good. Your head is on your shoulders. You're going to teach them it. You go there. Don't worry about everything else. Don't worry about all the other people over there. Worry about, you're going to teach the truth. People need you over there. Go. What if you're going to teach the lies? You're going to try to be popular. Tell everybody that they, they all have a share of the world to come. Stay home. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. The Gemara continues and it says, the meeting place of the sages will be used for harlotry. Sometimes you have Bateknesit, where it becomes like a bar. The rabbi starts befriending all types of women, all types of people. It becomes Ramash, an embarrassment to, 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 to Judaism. Chilul Hashem for the whole place to exist. By the way, you should know all of these places will be destroyed at the time of Mashiach. Just like they were destroyed at the time of World War II. All of the reformed places, every single one of them was destroyed. The Galilee will be destroyed and the Gavlan desolated. The people who dwell on the borders will wander from about town to town. But they will not be succored. It's a cord. The wisdom of the scribes will decay. There's not going to be as many Talmidei Chachamim. And those who dread sin will be despised. You start telling Yerei Chet, anybody has Yirat Shamaim, they're going to start making fun of you. You have Yirat Shamaim, they're going to start making fun of you. Why? Ah, no, come on. Why are you, are you scared? No, you have to serve Hashem from love. Serve Hashem from love. Love. No, come on. No. And what do you think? This is only happening to me. It's only happening... I'm going to show you a message. I'm not going to give you the name. I'm going to show you a message I got from a kid that goes to a yeshiva. Goes to a yeshiva. Unfortunately, the yeshiva, maybe he's, uh, I, don't know, I don't know whether it's a, a sav teaching them, or I'm not really sure who's teaching them. 
but this is the product of the Jews. This cute kid, Sadiq, sent me this, and he wants to tell the rest of his uh, classmates that uh, you have to have Yirat Shemaim. You have to have fear of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. It's important. And the guys are in school are making fun of him. What is what they're saying? So first he insults him for even asking questions. Like, how have you been asking these questions? Because he's telling him, listen, you're, you're, you're praying to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. You know, it's idolatry. Then he says that Rav Shach is nothing. And he says, I'm nothing also, because I'm part of the conversation. This is Talmud Yeshiva, says this. Oh, 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 it's my favorite part. It's my favorite part. He says that the Lubavitch Rebbe is a piece of God. This is what they're teaching Yeshiva today. This is Christianity. This is Christianity. This is not Judaism. Just because they put a tzaddik's name and turn it into Abu Dazara does not mean it's Judaism. And what is he doing? He sent him 15 text messages insulting him, calling him nothing, calling him stupid, calling him this. Why? Because the Lubavitcher Rebbe, according to this imbecile in the yeshiva, he's a piece of God. Why? Because you're not supposed to serve Hashem from fear and from this and from that. No, we don't learn Musar. Oh, you're going to serve Hashem out of fear. Why would you serve Hashem out of fear? You have to serve Him out of, out of love. You're going to serve Hashem out of love, right? Don't learn Musar. One second, let me finish. I mean, he told me you're wrong. So he tells me who you think you are and so on and so forth. Now, the interesting thing is, this not doesn't show us that they are worshipping idols, but also shows us they're not even worshipping their own idol properly. Why? Because even their own books, one of my dear Talmidim sent me a, uh, one of the Likute uh, Sichot of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And you see that he talks about some of the tzaddikim from Chabad. And it says the following in uh, page 59 of Likute uh, Sichot, Parashat Chayes Sarah. It says there's a uh, our Nesim, he says have shown us everything, including this principle of uh, awe of Hashem, awe before God. There's a well-known story of the Alter Rebbe that once in the middle of praying on, on Rosh Hashanah or on Yom Kippur, when the coming of the words, therefore put pechadecha, you know, put your, uh, put our, his fear, we're, fe- we're afraid of Hashem, he fell to the ground, rolling to and fro, saying pach, 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 meaning he could not, complete the word of Pachad in his prayer because he was thinking about the word. The Sadiq, the Alter Rebbe from Chabad, was thinking about the word Pachad of what he's supposed to have in front of his creator. He was so scared that he fell on the floor in the middle of prayer. These are the founders of Chabad. Then he continues, he says in another story of the Tzemach Tzedek Lubavitch, says in the early years of his leadership, he once sat in a Fabregan with other Hasidim and he drank a, a whole glass of uh, a whole glass of uh, vodka, and ordered a third one poured, 
but afterwards he moved his hand over his forehead and one could no longer detect any effects of the liquor. Why? Because the Tzemach Tzedek explained that when he concentrated his thoughts on the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and contemplated on the great fear that he has in front of his Creator, and that fear counteracted the effects of the strong wine. Meaning, Rabotai Karim, fearing of Hashem and Musar, and Yirat Shamayim is not a Orthodox Judaism thing, non Chabad thing, or it's a Yaron Ruven thing and a Rabbi Mizrahi thing and not everybody else thing. It's a Torah thing. It's one of the laws of the Torah. It's one of the 613 mitzvot. Fearing Hashem is a commandment from Akadosh Baruch Hu. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says, Akadosh Baruch Hu only created the world in order for you to fear Him. That's it. Yeah, what about the love? He goes, most of you are not going to reach love. I created you, so you fear me. Why? Because to fear, everybody could do. But if you do it in certain uh, yeshivot, they make fun of you. They tell you, no, are you crazy? The Lubavitch Rebbe is God. He's going to save you. And Lubavitch Rebbe said, don't study Musar. He never said that, by the way. No, I, I... He never said it. It's all shtuyot. But that's what's happening, Rabotai. The kids are going to yeshivot, they're learning from certain people who are either teaching them wrong or they're, mis- they're not teaching them properly, whatever it is. If you have Yirat Shamaim, Hashem Yirachem, look what you're going to have to go to as a Talmud Yeshiva. Just to survive, to wash a shoe and tell your friends about it, you have to be scared of them stoning you by the end of the week. This is a Nevuah in the Torah. People that have Yirat Shamaim, people that Yirechet, Yimasu, they're going to be despised. They're not going to let you be. They're not going to let you be. The truth will be absent, it says. You're not going to be able to find truth everywhere. You go on YouTube, you, you type in any Torah, you're going to have 5 million hits. Out of the 5 million hits, maybe 2 or 3 are going to be in it. You type in Chabad on the internet, maybe 1 or 2 of those rabbis are saying they're in you type in Orthodox Judaism. Maybe one or two here and there are going to say they're met on certain topics. Why? Emet is not so good for money. You tell people Emet, that means you tell them not to drive on Shabbat. You can tell them not to intermarry. A woman sent an email today. She goes, listen, I don't know, I'm a little concerned after I watch your video. Because I converted eight years ago, but... Uh, you're making it seem like my conversion is not legitimate because it's through a conservative, uh, conservative uh, synagogue. And uh, I don't know, I went, I tried to listen, I went to the synagogue over here, the Orthodox one, and I told them, listen, I want to convert Orthodox. But they rejected me because I'm married to a non-Jew. And he doesn't want to convert, he wants to believe in Yoshke. I said, y- you're still asking you're still asking if your conversion is legitimate from the conservative shul that allowed you to convert while you're married to a non-Jew that doesn't that believes in Yoshke? The truth, Rabotai Karim, is going to be despised. Youth will blanch the faces of elders, young little kids like this one. He sent them three or four voicemails just insulting me. This little chutzpan. Ah, he's a nothing, he's a nobody. He's, a, he's not even a piece of dust. All types of insult. I don't care. It doesn't affect me one way. But just to show you, if this is a Bachur Yeshiva, if this is the type of attitude that your Talmud is expressing to other rabbis, close down the Yeshiva, open up another public school, it's the same thing. They may actually act better. What's the point? If your Talmud Yeshiva is going to insult Rabbis, whether he knows them, agrees with them or not, but so far proven kosher, Baruch Hashem, you're going to have them insult people, call them nothing, and all types of other words. If that's your Talmud Yeshiva, close the school, open a public school, open a pizzeria, open a plumbing place. Don't know, close the place. That's your Talmud? This Rabbutai Karim is happening. I get these messages every week. Every week, different group of kids. Baruch Hashem, a lot of kids want to do tshuva, so they hear the shurim. 
They hear the shulim, but they, what do they have to deal with? They have to go to school. They tell their friends, listen, I heard this rabbi. He's really good. He said, Yirat Shamaim. He said, Musar. He said what Hashem said. Et Instead of saying, wow, you know what? Psh, I want to hear it too. What happens? They start throwing rocks at him. Start making fun of him. Why are you doing chuba? Were you crazy? No, come on. Well, you, you left your girlfriend? No, come on. What's wrong with you? This is what's happening today, Rabotai Yikarim. They make fun of older people. Skenim yamdu ipnek tanim. The elders will stand in the presence of minors. When I was a kid, you walk on a bus. You walk on a bus. If you sit down in a chair, but there's an older man there, everybody's going to yell you on the bus. What, are you crazy? Get up, kid. Let the old man sit. What's the matter with you? Chutzpan. You have any shame? What's the matter with you? Let the old man sit. They yell at you. How dare you sit? Today, it's the opposite. You see kids running to the chair to take the chair before the old man sits down. Sometimes you see situations where they force the old man to get up. Get up, old man. I want to sit here. You're sitting in my chair. What's the old man going to do? The son derides his father. Kids yelling at their parents, treating them like they're friends. One, one person made a video. Parents brought their kid, 16-year-old kid, a new car. They bought him a used truck. He saw the truck. He was so unhappy. He went back inside the house, and the parents are videotaping this, thinking the kid's going to be happy. To their miserable surprise, the kid was so unhappy he went back inside, he took a metal baseball bat and started going on top of the car, smashing it to pieces. As a thank you to Abba and Ima for buying him a car. Why? Because it was used. That kid doesn't even deserve a baseball bat. Little does he deserve a, a, a car. But this is one of the most disgusting videos I've seen in my life. That's this generation. A daughter rises against her mother. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Kids talking to their parents. Kids talking to their parents like they're friends. Kids are talking to their parents like they... So the mitzvah protects people. Don't worry. The young women today, if they get instructions from their mother, Sometimes they take it. Sometimes they yell at their mother like she's our girlfriend. No, Ima, shut up already with that. Stop it with that already. You don't understand the times. You're like old already. What old? I'm 40 years old. What old? No, Ima, come on. No, with your craziness. I'll come back home when I feel like it. A little Bati side comes home at 1 o'clock in the morning. 2 o'clock in the morning. Our Ima says, it's not acceptable while you're in my house. What are you doing? No, Ima, come on. Uh, I was out with Steve. <laughs> Meaning, even the Ima cannot even rebuke her own daughter. She can't even tell her what to do. Why? The daughter's going to break the house. I got one poor guy, one poor guy, me skin. I don't even know how to. I can't help him. I can't help him. He tells me his daughter has lost her mind. She's 13 years old, 14 years old. She lost her mind completely. He's calling me, he's calling Rav Mizrach, he's calling anybody that's going to pick up the poor guy. Misken, he says, I'm so scared of my daughter, we all go and we lock our bedrooms because we're scared she's going to kill us while we're sleeping. Hashem Yilachem. He saw her phone, she has all type of satanic videos on her phone. This is a girl that went to a, uh, to a Bet Yaakov. She went to a Bet Yaakov, she has satanic videos on her phone. He says, I'm scared of my daughter, we all lock our room. Me and all the kids are scared to death. I said, call the cops. He says, no, I'm scared to call the cops. I'm scared to call the cops. Why this 14-year-old may slice my throat? This is what we have. 
Now, he says, the uh, daughter-in-law against our mother-in-law. Many times you see, divorces happen. Why? Because of the in-laws. It used to be that the in-laws were good. The mother-in-law was like a mother. It's called mother-in-law because she was like a second mother. That's how it's supposed to be. Today, more divorces are, are, are happening because of the in-laws than anything else. Why? The in-laws decided that they're going to move next door. Why? They want to come to your house eight times a week. <laughs> they want to live in your house. Yeah, but I'm married now. I'm not in your house anymore. You come over once in a while. No problem. Come once a week. Come for Shabbat. I'll come to you. Come to me. But now don't live in my house. No, she's my daughter. Don't tell me what to do. She's my daughter. She's my, he's my son. He's my baby. I came here before you. The mom starts yelling at the new bride, Hashem Yerachem, and the new bride doesn't know what to do. And then the mother says, listen, no, 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 son, tell, tell your new wife that I'm, I'm, I'm the best cook. Tell your new wife I'm the best cook. New, show it. And the poor guy doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to disrespect his wife. He doesn't want to respect his mom. He doesn't know what to do. He says, yeah, yeah, Ima, you're the best. And his wife takes it personally. Why? Because she's slaving herself seven days a week to cook for this pegil. And he's giving compliments to his wife in front of her and so on and so forth. She doesn't know how to take it. She starts crying all night. She says, listen, you know, go marry your mother. Go marry your mother. I don't want to be with you. I got one woman cries to me once a week. Cries to me once a week. She says, why? My husband didn't come home again. I said, why not? He's at his mother's house again. He just decides not to come home, sleep at his mother's house two, three days a week. He's married with kids. I said, I'm sorry, I have no idea how to help such a thing. I don't know, tell you to find a new husband, I'm scared of worse, next one's going to be worse with this generation. You don't know. You don't know. People have no idea what marriage is. In-laws are causing a lot of problems. I had one kid tell me, listen, I want to get married. The girls are Bat Yisrael, Kedoshah, amazing. I said, so what's the problem? Because my father doesn't like her. I said, why? She didn't say hello right away one time. It's okay, so say I'm sorry. Because she said I'm sorry, sorry, 15 times already. She bought him a present. She did this, she did that. She went, Mamash, she's begging him for forgiveness. He won't forgive her. I said, your father was, uh, he doesn't know anything. He goes, no, my father's a rabbi. I said, Hashem I said, your father's a rabbi? He says, my father's a rabbi. I said, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sorry to tell you, but you can't listen to your rabbi. You can't listen to this father of yours. You have to marry this girl. She's a bat Israel. He had the wedding. The father didn't come to the wedding. Why? She didn't say hello one time. Right away. She said it five seconds later. The stupidity of people is reaching new highs. New highs. That's what the Gemara says. I'm reading you, not the newspaper. I'm reading you what the Gemara says 2,000 years ago. Then it says, a man's enemies are going to be the people of his household. Unfortunately, that happens a lot. People, unfortunately, have no shlombite in their house. They have wars between them and their spouse, wars between them and their kids. You think that your family is all going to be one unit. You end up having hatred. I had one client. He founded a big dog food company, made his kids, everybody, multimillionaires, made literally hundreds of millions of dollars, gave a piece of the company to each one of their kids, and then one day, all the kids went against the father. He gave you everything you have, you go it against him. Why? Part of the Gemara. Part of what's going to happen before the, uh, gen- the uh, Mashiach is going to come. The face of the generation is going to be the face of a dog. You're going to have a face, you're going to have a generation where people have no shame whatsoever. People are doing their business in the middle of the street. All types of business. Their private intimate business, their pre- the filth that they do in the street. They uh, relieve themselves, they're with their wife, they're with their husband, they're with their whoever. All types of disgusting things in the middle of the street and it's normal business. People make a living out of recording this garbage. This would have never happened. Even the sota, even the, the, the prostitutes of previous generations wouldn't look like a, uh, like a housewife today. They were all covered. Today, you have no idea who is the prostitute dancer and who is the rabbanit. Why? How they dress, you can't tell the difference. Sometimes you see the rabbi hugging the rabbanit on the internet, giving her a kiss to show people that he has shlom bait. He doesn't know in Allah, says, you're not allowed to touch your wife in public. Not allowed to touch her. It's funny, but it's not funny. 
If it wasn't true, it would be hysterical. Unfortunately, all of this is happening. And he says a son is not a best in the presence of his father, that the son is going to do his business in front of his father. Son's going to bring girlfriends to the house. No shame. Abba, what do you think of her? Disgusting, filthy. Behavior that you're supposed to have in front of your parents. Shev there, you got Shemaim in front of them, the fear of God. Bring a girlfriend to the house, you filthy little kid. No, I'm in my room. My room. Your kid's room shouldn't have doors. Why are you locking it for? For what? You want to get dressed? Get dressed in the bathroom. Kids are locking their doors like they have something to hide. What are you hiding? Only problems you're hiding. Ima, don't come into my room. Don't come into my room. Don't come into my house. You start paying mortgage, then you say something. <laughs> don't come into my room. But that's what's happening. Kids have no respect. And he says, finally, this horrible, filthy, disgusting generation, before Mashiach, the 50th level of Tum'ah, what do we have to rely on then? Ela al avinu only thing you have to rely on is a Kadosh Baruch Hu in the end. If you stick to what a Kadosh Baruch Hu said, you're going to be in good shape. You don't, you're going to be in serious, serious problems. Why? Your family's going to break. Your family's going to have problems. Your kids are going to disrespect you. Your spouse is going to hate you. Your money's going to be unblessed. You're going to make a lot of money, but you're not going to have anything to show for it. All types of things, all of the garbage that we read here will happen to a person. How do we know? That's what Rabbi Shimon over says. He says... In uh, Zohar Matok Midvash, he says, or actually even before, he says that this Erev Rav, all of the sins coming from the Erev Rav, this is all the leaders, the leaders of the exile. This is all coming. All of the sins are being taught by these leaders, by the Mirvis of the world, by the Goldbergs of the world. They're teaching your kids that they can do whatever they want. Express yourself. He says that this generation is going to be a flood of problems. It's going to be during the pre-Messianic days until Hashem will sit on His throne and will rest on the Ark of Ararat. What does it mean on the Ark of Ararat? Ark of Ararat is like Noah's Ark. But what is it really symbolic of? It says Ararat comes from the word Aru. Aru is cursed. Because the, the, the mountains of Ararat this, uh, is, is representative of the generation of all the wicked people is full of wickedness that's darkening Am Yisrael in the exile. Because Am Yisrael will be Aru. Am Yisrael will be cursed while it's in the exile because all of the rebukes and the curses that are in Parashat Bechukotai, Parashat Azinu, Parashat Kitavo, all of them will come and become fulfilled Hashem Yerachem during the exile. All of the curses that are in the Torah will happen to Am Yisrael Hashem Yerachem. Now, in the Gemara, it says it could be this, it could be that. It could be that Hashem comes in a good way. It could be that there's going to be war, Gog and Magog. Zohar says, no, I'm going to tell you a secret. Before Mashiach comes, everything's going to happen. Why? They're not going to do tshuva. They're not going to do tshuva by themselves. Rabbi Shemob Yechai is already telling you, they're not going to do tshuva by themselves. The war is going to happen. Stop living a dream. Stop imagining that everything's going to be fine. Mashiach is going to come with some wings and everybody has uh, kumbaya. Not going to happen. There's going to be serious, serious problems. So much so that the Amish is considered Aru. What Aru? Aru means they're cursed from Shemaim because of they haven't done Tshuva. And the wicked, the wicked will succeed in a very big way, the Zohar says. Why? Why are the wicked going to succeed before Mashiach comes? To pay them for the few mitzvot they did in this world, so to eliminate them from Olam Abba. Rasha Merusha starts a Kabbalah center, billion dollars. Another Rasha opens a Beknesset, starts a campaign for a million dollars, raises five million. Another wicked person starts a little thing, becomes multi-billion dollar enterprise. All of these wicked people are succeeding. You're like, why? Why is anybody listening to this guy? Because Hashem is paying them cash. He's paying them all cash to destroy them. They did a few mitzvot. They gave some staka once in a while. They put on tefillin here and there. They said yes. They said no. Whatever they did, a few mitzvot, Hashem pays them cash. 
couple of guys that were in a cash advance business, Hashem Yachem, made $60 million. $60 million before they sold the business. So if that wasn't enough, Chilul Hashem, what these two Jewish guys did, unfortunately, Bezat Hashem, they do tshuva. But if that wasn't enough, the Chilul Hashem continued. Bloomberg made an article about them. They, uh, you know, our movie says, Hashem took back his millions, right? It said, they gave up God and he gave the millions. That's what the article is called. They gave up God and he gave the millions. Why? They were both Bachur Yeshiva. They were both Bachur Yeshiva. Happens to also be Chabad, by the way. Both Bachur Yeshiva. And unfortunately, they gave up God. And unfortunately, took a lot of people with them and millions of dollars they got. Who? Kadosh Bachur gave it to them. Why? You don't do Tshuva. This is your price for the few years you were in Yeshiva. You think you're in good shape now in Puerto Rico? You think you're in, uh, in fantastic shape, eating pig every morning, being with all of these uh, filthy people around you all day? No, no, no. What you have right now, that's your end. You should be crying blood that you got this money. You should be crying blood that you have success because that means that Kadosh Baruch Hu is paying you cash in this world. They made an article about these two boys to... Mamash, big chilul Hashem. Big chilul Hashem. I hope, I hope Mamash, one of them watches this, gets scared to death and calls me so I can help them do tshuva and fix this chilul Hashem they did. An article written about you, you gave up God, that's why Kadosh Baruch gave you millions? You should pay $50 million just for them to remove the article. Even though the article is already a few years old. What a chilul Hashem. Hashem Yachem. You can't even fix chilul Hashem. Only Kiddush Hashem can fix it. I'm hoping they watch this and get scared instead of get offended like some of the other imbeciles in the world thinking that I get benefit out of offending people. But if you're in trouble, I have to scream fire because no one else apparently is doing it. Now, this Rabotai Yekarim sounds very depressing. But the Zohar Kadosh in Tikkunah Zohar page 130 B in Matok Midvash 431, says, don't give up. Why don't give up? Because as we already learned, Eliyahu Navi comes in several forms. Not just Eliyahu Navi Mamash, not just Eliyahu Navi that's going to tell us Mashiach is already here and it's too late, but also in a way for you to get Chidushim, a way for you to get more Avodat Hashem. Why? Who does it go to? It goes to people that want to do Kiruv. He goes to people that want to do Avodat Hashem. They want to do something to help Am Yisrael do tshuva. Which means that each and every single one of you could be a little Eliyahu Navi, whether you're male or female. You could be a little Eliyahu Navi by taking your Torah, by taking your money, by taking your, your skills, by taking what you have and publicizing it in order to get Am Yisrael to do tshuva. Because what ends up happening, the Zohar Kadosh says, because one that helps others do tshuva, they end up bringing the shefa, the reward, not just in the next world, but also in this world, they get. Why do you get reward in this world? Why do you get such a reward that's so extraordinary? You benefit from it in this world. You get protection in this world. You get benefits financially in this world. Everything good in this world and the next. Why? Because as long as there's Reshaim in the world, we all lose. By you helping people do tshuva, what are you doing also? Aside from returning Hashem's children back home, what are you also doing? You're eliminating the number of Reshaim in the world. Each time you help Steve do tshuva, you help Miriam do tshuva, you help Moshe do tshuva, you help Tzvika do tshuva, you help all these different people do tshuva, these people were Reshaim. These people mechale Shabbat. These people were of Davod Azara. Now you're going to help them do tshuva. You're lowering the number of reshaim in the world. You're lowering the number, of the, the number, of the quantity of tumah in the world. There's a special price for that, and it's both a material and a spiritual benefit. So much so that a person that could be learning in yeshiva for 15, 20 years. If he starts taking on himself, putting half hour, an hour, two hours a day to do kiruv to help Am Yisrael do tshuva, Akadosh Baruch Hu could literally make him learn more in one day than he learned in 15 years. Why? Shut 
benefit of the public. Because what ends up happening, Rabotai, the Chachamim use the prophet Echa, chapter 4, verse 20, and says, Ruach apinu Mashiach Hashem nilkad b'mishchitotam. It says that the breath of our nostrils, Hashem's anointed, meaning the Mashiach, was caught in their trap. The Mashiach is being held up because of who? Because of the Reshaim. And there's anger that comes to the world because of it. So when you help people, Chazal says when you help people do tshuva, there's less anger of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the world. And we get closer to the salvation, we get closer to the good times. More Torah can come to the world to help even more people. By you publicizing Torah, by you taking money and donating it to Kiruv, by you taking time doing Kiruv with it, by you doing something to help Klal Israel do tshuva that works, you, my friend, are benefiting more than anyone else in the world. You're literally being a little in the Yawanavi. You're becoming a little Eliyahu Navi. Male, female, child, adult, doesn't make a difference. You're becoming a little Eliyahu Navi. Why? Because that's what the Rambam told us here. He told us, yes, there is an opinion that Eliyahu Navi Mamash is going to come. But before he says that, he says that there's going to be Ya'amod Navi Le'asher Yisrael Le'achin Libam. Before the war, go, go, the war of Gogu Magog, there's going to be a Navi. There's going to be a prophet. There's going to be a speaker. There's going to be somebody that's going to help Am Yisrael, what? Become inspired to do tshuva and fix their heart in preparation for Mashiach. Because if the Mashiach already arrives right now, Hashem Yachem, the rest of the verse gets fulfilled. Hashem has to punish everyone. But if you help Am Yisrael do tshuva, you're not only helping them, you're helping yourself. Because you become that Navi. Sometimes you're that Navi by speaking. Sometimes you're that Navi by just simply putting a credit card and putting automatic charge every month, hundred, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a month, whatever it is. Whatever you could afford. The point being, Rabotai Karim, is that every single person is being given a chance to help Am Yisrael do tshuva. Be'ezrat Hashem, each one of us takes advantage of this chance, takes advantage of this chut, to be a little Eliyahu Navi. Because everyone can do something. If each and every one of us, just one example, simple one, each and every one of us takes a few minutes for the next couple of days looking at their phone and seeing who could I get to come to the shiur on Tuesday? Who could I get to come to the shiur on Wednesday? And each person brings another five people. We're all going to have to stand up. Why? We're not going to have room. But it's better we all stand up because we don't have room because there's more people than it being so roomy over here that you can pretty much do gymnastics. Because now you become a little Eliyahu Navi. Now you did something with this knowledge to keep it to yourself for what? What do you want to be? Incarnated by yourself? When you go up to Shemaim, they're going to show you a lot of things. And I promise you, the one thing that everybody who does not do Kiruv is going to be sad about is that they're going to be shown all of the people that are in Genom because of them. Because of them. Why? He was your next door neighbor. He was your colleague. He was your brother. He was your sister. He was your whatever he was. He was your father. And you never even did anything. One time you sent him a video. And he said, ah, this rabbi is scary. I don't want to hear scary rabbis. Don't send me this stuff anymore. And you actually listen to this guy. He doesn't know that it's a cure. He doesn't know that this is the way to do Kiruv. No, it's too scary. It's too scary. It's too scary. So we're going to finish with this. The Torah tells us a lot of things. It tells us how to do tshuva. It tells us who our Avot HaKadoshim were. It tells us who Hashem is. It tells us a lot of things. Now, last week, it told us a little bit about Avraham Avinu. Now, no one will disagree that Avraham Avinu is Kodesh Kodeshim. Even the Christians and the Muslims appreciate Avraham Avinu. Everybody appreciates Avraham. No one in the world says, Avraham, nah, could be do, he could have done a better job. No one says that. Avraham, Kodesh Kodeshim. Now let's see what Avraham Avinu, why is he such a big deal? 
The Zohar Kadosh says in Parashat Lech Lecha, in Daf Pei, Amud Bet, Vavraham Vavdin Tavim Betshuva Beoraita Bekola. He says, Vat Sadiq, why does Sadiq Avraham has so much schuyot and so many maasim tovim? Because of his tshuva and his Torah and all the things that he fulfilled. What, what, is the, what, what did he fulfill? Zohar says, what did he fulfill? So, okay, so he learned Torah. A lot of people learn Torah. He says, Mizdarez l'arez l'alechet el elu ha-reshaim l'achziram b'tshuva al avonotem. He says, Avraham was in a hurry to go chase after the reshaim to help them do tshuva on their sins. That's why he's such a tzaddik. That's why Hashem loved him so much. Yeah, but a lot of people help people do tshuva. What makes Avram special? Because he chases after them and he tells them what is the deen, what is the judgment in the next world, and all of the details of what happens in Gehenom. That's what makes Avram Avinu the best Kiruv Rabbi in history. The biggest Mezakeh Rabim in history. No one in the world ever did like him. Why? The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says, he was so good, he got the merits of all ten generations between Noach and him. Because anyone that did Shuvah, good for them. Anyone like Eliezer did Shuvah, good for him. But anyone who didn't do Shuvah, millions of people didn't do Shuvah. They did in the beginning, then they fell off. Avraham Avinu got all of their Olam Abba. All of their Olam Abba he got. Why? Because they have Olam Abba. But their ticket doesn't work if they don't do mitzvot. So who gets it? The Kiruv Rabbi that actually helped them. And they don't want to listen. He told them, listen, Shabbat is this. You don't want to listen? Okay, I get you all out. Benef- I benefit anyway. You, my friends, you go to your friends. You go to your partners. You go to somebody. You tell them about Torah. You give them a shiur. You send them a, a text message. You invite them to a shiur. Whether they like it or not is not your business. Why? You tell them the truth. Their neshama will know it's the truth. Whether they follow or not is their business. But you win anyway. You win anyway. Why? Because you did what Avraham Avinu did. You do what Avraham Avinu did. Avraham Avinu was the best of the best. Why? Because he chased after people. He went out of his way. Not just sending a WhatsApp message one time hoping for the best. You know, some people, they send a blast message to 150 people hoping that's enough. No, my friend. Sometimes you got to make a phone call. Sometimes you got to show up in their house. You have to show some effort like Avraham Avinu. Chase after people. Come home an extra half hour early from work on the day of the shiul so you can help a few people come to the shiul. Don't just send a mass text message. Ah, oh, whoever comes, comes. And Shabbat, they say, oh yeah, these are all the people that didn't come. Here, again, no, let me show you the details. And you have to see all these people that you were friends with suffer. You're going to, that's, 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 that's Gainom already, watching them. You have to do something. You got to do a little more than just sending a, a, a blast text message hoping for the best. Because Rabotai Yikarim, Avraham Avinu, Aya mochiach otam, machzir otam b'tshuva ila kadosh baruch hu. He helped people do tshuva by simply telling them the details, telling them what happens if you don't do it. You don't necessarily need to start the conversation with the details. You don't even need to say it yourself. But you have to try to get the truth to these people. Let them know that if they continue making fun of rabbis, they continue making fun of Hashem, they continue violating Hashem's mitzvot, only bad will follow in this world and the next. We don't want them to have bad. We want them to have good. We don't want them to be part of the Erev Rav that gets destroyed. We want them to be part of Am Yisrael that goes to Allah Abai and benefits and is celebrating and so on. We want all of Klal Yisrael to do tshuva. But unfortunately, Rabotai Karim, there's only one version of tshuva. There's only one version of tshuva. There's only one Torah. There's no two sides to tshuva. It's either you do it or you don't. You keep Shabbat or you don't keep Shabbat. You keep Tarat Mishpacha or you don't keep Tarat Mishpacha. You watch your eyes, you don't watch your eyes. You watch your speech, you don't watch your speech. There's no like, you know, half-half tshuva. You're either going to do what Hashem says or not. You're going to try your best or not. But if you see that your surroundings are a bunch of wicked people, run away. Find a different place. Don't be friends with them. Protect yourself. Don't fall because everybody else is a loser. Get yourself out of the hole. Protect yourself. You could try to help them, but from a distance. 
This Abutai Karim is what made Avraham Avinu so special. This is what can make each one of us special. To go out of our way and be a little Eliyahu Navi of this generation before it's too late. Because once Eliyahu Navi Mama shows up and says, okay, Mashiach is here, that's it. There's no more Tshuva. There's no more nothing. Everything is finished. The clock is up. And anyone that didn't do enough is going to regret that day. They're not going to be happy. Why? Because they're going to know their brother, their sister, their cousin, their uncle, their this one, their best friend from childhood. All these people, they didn't try. It's not that they tried and failed. If they tried and failed, there's nothing to feel bad about. You tried and failed. They didn't want to do it. It's not your fault anymore. But there's a bunch of people you didn't try. Why? You didn't want to offend them. You didn't want to turn them off. You didn't want to do a lot of things, even though Kadosh Baruch himself says that's the only way to help them do tshuva. In this generation of, 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 of chutzpanim, the only thing that works is by telling people there's schar and there's onish. There's reward, there's punishment. The reward is endless. The punishment is also endless. Bezat Hashem, this helps every single one of us do even more tshuva. Get prepared for Eliyahu Navi by becoming a small little version of him, by publicizing the Torah and helping Am Yisrael come back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Amen.